sphere of sapphire blue and emerald green against a blanket of absolute black. Fragile in its perfection. Closer. Through the atmosphere, through the muffled clouds, and we break into fresh dusk. There is an island close to the continent. On it, a city. Smoggy and sprawling. The lights of offices and houses beginning to glimmer in the gray. In this city is a suburb, a spider web of roads, a patchwork of parks and open spaces. At the top of the high street by the woods is a tree-lined avenue with pitched roofs and long gardens. In one of the gardens is a wide square, a mattress on the lawn, white pillows and white quilt. A bed. Lying on it is a couple, a man and a woman, past their youth but not yet middle aged. His swarthiness throws the white cotton into relief, as does her auburn hair spread across the pillow. The tendril, they are Esther and Carlo, man and wife for almost seven years. He has a job in an office, she works with children. He resents her. She feels unloved. In a bedroom in the house are two girls, four and eight, with big eyes, perfect skin, and precious ways. They sleep soundly now, but earlier had fought and cried not to go to bed. Esther, alone with them, as she often was, threatened sanctions, but they both ignored her, as they often did. It took all the strength not to slam out of the door and never come back. Lately, she had felt like that a lot. Now Esther and Carlo stare ahead into the darkening sky, lying apart. I brought the bed out here so we'd be away from things. I feel suffocated in the house. There's so much going on, Esther says. Tonight, for once, she has led the rabbit blame and bitterness that so often black her bound across the garden and into the suburban twilight. At eight o'clock, exactly when she had been certain the children were asleep, she had closed the door on the stack of washing and ironing, ignored the dusty skirting boards and dirty pallets, got the bills and paperwork. Instead, she stripped their bed, dragged the tea-stained mattress off the frame, onto the landing and let it slide on one side, down the carpeted stairs to the red tiled hall. It had taken a lot of strength to get it through the house and out the back door, but she had strength, plenty of it, more than he ever dare admit. She could put the mattress square in the middle of the grass, equidistant between the flower borders on the left and right, and the patio and climbing frame which marked front and back. She then wrapped the sheets and pillowcases, brand new, brilliant, white Egyptian cotton, and made the bed. When Carlo came home from his late meeting, she'd ask him to go outside. He'd huffed and grumbled. They'd gone into the back garden, the only light, the one she, she left on in the kitchen in the constant yellow glow of the suburban. She had said to him, this is our bed tonight. Please lie down. What? This is ridiculous. It's too cold. What about the neighbors? I haven't got time for these silly games. Lie on the bed, she said quietly, or I'll pack my bags and leave now. He paused. It wasn't what she had said that had made him think. She had said it a hundred times over the last years. It was the way she had said it, a voice totally balanced, considered, as if she was perfectly ready and able to leave. Okay, he replied, took off his jacket, pulled off his shoes, got under the quilt. She joined him, clothed in a skirt and blouse, but with bare feet. They lie there far apart. They always lie far apart. They have done for years. He never touches her anymore, even though he knows that when she sobs in the night darkness, it is because she longs to be touched. As 
as the universe looks down, they look up. The sky is clear and blue black, punctured with little white lines and patterns. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, he says. For a minute she sees a glimmer of affection on his face and the pain of him telling her yesterday that she had put on weight as she stood by the sink washing up flutters away like a night butterfly. Did you have a good day at work? she asks. Okay. There's a minute silence. It would be nice if you asked me now and again. There is full of silence. I can't believe the sky is so clear, Esther continues, that we can still see the constellations even with this light pollution. When they had first met, Carlo would spend hours with her by when they first met, Carlo would spend hours with her in the park by their parents' houses and talk to her about the stars. He had a dream of being an astronomer, learning everything about the stars, building an observatory in the attic of the rambling house they would one day share. But soon he had started at the office, and now he checks the work of other people, a soulless, parasitic job for which he has no respect. There's Cassiopeia. As the points to the stars forming an M shape to the southeast. Banished to the sky for believing she was too beautiful. She brings down her arm and puts it under the quilt. I don't feel beautiful, Carlo. You don't make me feel beautiful. Don't start this, he says and turns over. He's back to her, wondering whether he should partake in this silly game anymore especially if it's just an excuse to talk. She says so much that he can't hear her anymore. It's just white noise that pains his ears. Perhaps he should just get up out of the makeshift bed and go inside. There's a football game on now. Not one he's particularly interested in, but a game all the same. Esther sees his annoyance and feels a familiar cramp of frustration growing in his stomach. Why can't he just listen? Why can't he understand? Or at least try to. Is she really as worthless as he makes her feel? She used to tell him how he made her feel all the time. Sometimes she'd be soft, cook him a meal, bring it up over wine. But other times, more often, she would scream it. He never hears, no matter how she tells him. And now it is the last time she's willing to say it. She takes a breath, tries another way again. There's, an, there's Andromeda, the chain maiden, chained to a rock waiting to be rescued. She knows she can locate the exact star in the blackness. And there's Cepheus, he mutters, turning back to the sky, our king with a crown. When he joins in, I'll bite how hard he lives. The pain of him telling her she wasn't as attractive as the other mothers at their daughter's birthday party separates from her, flutters up and away chasing the last night butterfly. I cannot see Pegasus, Carlos says, as if to himself. Pegasus was born from the blood of Medusa when she was slain by Perseus, he recites mechanically. I read that in a book when I was studying. He doesn't study anymore. He doesn't do anything anymore other than buy books he never reads and music he rarely listens to. The house is full of things he had bought from his wages, but even though he has so much, he still feels empty. Esther hates all the clutter. She wants to throw it away, start again. She doesn't want to do the same thing year after year, buy the same things until they both disappear in the amount of junk they bought with the wages they earned while life has passed them by. He didn't care how she felt. He simply didn't care. But screaming and crying had changed nothing, so now she pushes her disappointment down into her very center 
and tells herself that soon, if nothing changes, she will leave for sure. I'd forgotten, Paolo begins, not only to himself this time, but so she can hear what the night sky is like. I haven't looked for years, he says with wonder. <coughs> I haven't looked up for as long as I can remember. And they both move a few inches closer to each other without even realizing it. Sometimes, she says, when you go to bed early, I come outside with a glass of wine and try to remember what it used to be like when we looked at the sky together. But it is it's so long ago now, I'm starting to forget. A bottle of wine, she muses. That sounds like a good idea. There's one in the fridge, but I'm too lazy and cold to get it. She laughs a slight tinkle of a laugh he hasn't heard for ages. He smiles at her happiness and hum somehow, unperceptibly, they again move a little closer together. She feels the heat of being near him and she wants to reach out, touch his arm under the covers, but she doesn't. She has been pushed away so many times now that if it happens again, her heart will break and he will never be able to repair it. That it will be too late to fix things frightens her more than anything. I'll get the wine in a moment, he says softly. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. She shifts deliberately so she is close now. She wants him to know that it hurts her to always keep her distance. He reciprocates ever so slightly. Now they are lying side by side, the curve of her hip touching the straight part of his pelvis almost burning through his trousers and making him uncomfortable, but he doesn't move. If he moves away now, it may be forever. She stares ahead as he looks at her in profile. The electric light from the house falls on the side of her face, so the kick of her nose and the curve of her chin is illuminated against the dark beyond. For a moment, he imagines a night when she's no longer in the bed beside him, when he's unable to reach for her even though he wants to, when perhaps she's in bed with someone else, someone who recognizes her beauty and keeps hold of this knowledge. It disturbs him, hurts him even. He realizes how easy it would be to lose her. He thinks of their children so reliant on them both, and suddenly he knows they will never get this time again, and all the bitterness and bickering is a waste. leans over, kisses her, and the kiss flies into the air, away from the garden, up and up until the white bed is just a dot, then through the atmosphere into space where it will stay for eternity. Looking down on a sphere, sapphire blue and emerald green against the blanket of absolute black fragile in its perfection. <laughs>